way, we're going to be looking at it a little bit differently. Most of the time, our training programs talk about, okay, developing those policy and procedures. What do we go through when we uh, talk about the hiring process, the orientation, the training, provision, the accident investigations, and the maintenance side of it, drug testing, all of those things. Well, if we're continuing to have problems with this particular area from a loss trend perspective, then maybe we need to go back and revisit just a little bit some of the foundational pieces, and that's really what I'd like to talk about today. Going back to some of the risk management components there. So why is it that auto is so difficult? We have a continued number of different departments that are involved. That, that's one of the items. We've got emergency drivers, emergency vehicles. So we've got law enforcement, we've got uh, fire department, ambulance operations on the not emergency side. We've got the CDL drivers and then the ATOs, all the others, but we like the acronyms. So sometimes we call it the white fleet, those that are non-CDL. But you know, what we're trying to get to today is more of a overall blanket type uh, discussion here that would apply to all of these types of vehicles. So some of these items that we try to get into are influenced by a lot of different things. Let me try to get out of the way of everyone. 96% of the auto accidents are caused by poor driver choices. We've known that for a long time. It's the decision that the drivers make while they're in that moment of driving. Okay? We all know that. We also know that um, auto accidents are three times the cost of most other workplace injuries. This includes work comp stuff as well. Automobile accidents are also the number one fatality source for any work area. Each year we've got three to four thousand people that die while driving for work. That's a lot of stuff that goes on there. The questions that we get when we go out and do our risk assessments and, and our consulting services out at the accounts, we start diving into this auto piece and we get the comments of, well, how can I manage the drivers? I can't see them. Think of it as a remote works, work area, workspace. These guys are away from the usual cubicle, farm, that sort of thing. They're out away from uh, the line of sight of the supervisor. So how are they going to act? We hear it. Yeah, we get calls all the time, complaints from all over the place, people driving crazy. Well, what do we do with those? Those are actually yellow warning flags that say if we don't do something, we may have a, an additional problem. So all of these are components, uh, symptoms of some things that uh, are raising their little heads here. Uh, and this one just drives us nuts. No, we don't really have any expectations of our drivers. When we go out and interview a driver, it's like, okay, so what did you learn during your first day when you were here? Well, they told me, you know, uh, keep this thing clean and let's uh, let's not be crashing into anybody. And that's about that's about it. As we throw the keys and hit them in the back of the head and say, <laughs> you're already late. Go. Some of those things are a little bit uh, counterproductive there, so some of them we're going to get into here. Auto risk management can be a monster, but you know what? There are some ways to break it down so we can understand a little bit about what's going on and what influences and what drives those particular uh, driver actions out there in the field. So stick with me. This is a little different than the, the traditional path of talking about the auto risk management. 
Accidents do have causes. We all know that. I've been in the industry for over 30 years, and oftentimes we talk about, so what's the, the focus of a safety person, risk control, risk management? Well, we're out there trying to identify hazards. Well, guess what? There's a precursor to the hazard. It exists for a reason. We're needing to talk today about the causes that allow these things to be in existence. Okay? So 95% of accidents have two or more causes that are there that allow them to exist. We're going to dive into that in our next slide. But just know that on the accident prevention side, we need to be identifying and predicting those causes as an overall part of what we're doing. That's an active part of the risk management philosophy. And then implementing those controls where we can find them. Has everybody gone through some accident investigation training? Show of hands. Yes, no, yeah. Oftentimes we talk about trying to identify the root cause. But you know, as a consultant going in and looking on accident investigation or causation. But this particular graphic can be used in all types of discussions and evaluations of accidents, no matter whether it's work comp, whether it's auto, GL, or whether it's the missing Malaysian Flight 370. There are all different types of things that we need to be asking about. So. We just got through with the snow season, or maybe we're still in snow season. You know, we see a lot of snow plow accidents. So let's talk about, okay, so if we have an individual that had the snow plow accident, they scraped somebody's vehicle, it's turned into you, and you start looking at it and saying, well, what were the drivers of this particular thing? The individual driver was involved, his driving decisions or hers. Did they have the appropriate training? What were those issues there? The equipment that they were operating, including cell phones, tablets, Game Boys, iPads, computer devices that uh, might be installed on the vehicle, or whether they're carried on. Those are things we need to really actively look at. The entity policy and procedures there. And you'll notice that I've got these broken into entity and departmental policy because oftentimes in our policy and procedure personnel handbook, it talks a little bit about fleet safety there and sets that basic guideline. And then down in the departmental area, it further explains that. And that's fine. As the evaluators, we can go in and look. So where did we fall down? Where were the parts that uh, we didn't meet those particular specifications on it? In the environment part of it, historically we've talked about is it wet, is it dry, daylight, dark, but you know there are other components here as well. How much of a hurried atmosphere were they in? Oftentimes in the snowplow type accidents we ask, so how many drivers did, or how many hours did that individual buy? They were on their 20th hour. Was that a part of the cause? Yeah, I think it probably was. Do we need to go back and, and affect what is in the departmental rules, setting some sort of guidelines to be reasonable for the number of continuous hours they can work? Yeah, probably. So when we're thinking in this process, we can take a look at 
and develop many things like job hazard analysis. Break this chart out. It helps us explore and keep our minds going down the right path. When we have to develop new job descriptions, it's a good idea to pull this, as well as for accident investigations. There are many different uses, uses for that. So when we're preparing and, and talking about all of the causes, we know what the end effect was. The snow pile had the crash over there. We can work backwards from those sometimes. So when we're thinking about all of these components that go into what happens on a day-to-day -day process out in the field, then we can move forward and talk about some of the fixes. Some of the uh, items that, that we have run across when we go in and, and evaluate what happened, a good number of the accidents are distracted driving. You guys know about this website? Distraction.gov. It's a very good website to provide some training materials for yourselves in-house. They've got many different uh, things there that you can even uh, put your name on. Customize those for your own departmental items. But as it talks about here, with the distraction component, we've got the manual distraction, which is taking the hands off the wheel, the visual, which is taking eyes off of the road, and then the mental side of it, the cognitive piece, which is taking your mind off driving. So about 40% of all the auto accidents out there usually entail some sort of distraction. Okay? Once again, drivers making the decision to do some of those things. And just rest assured that they will fill in the blank and talk about doing... Uh, they will utilize their own ideas about what should be done if there are no company guidelines, no entity uh, preferred processes. Okay, So let's dive in just a little bit on the accident trends that we see that have developed. When we look at overall from, uh, from coast to coast, usually law enforcement and public works have a larger division of the claims than anybody else. That's not a big deal. That's uh, fairly dependable from one year to the next. And law enforcement and public work drive most miles, right? But then we should also consider they need some special focus. When we talk about frequency, we've got a large piece here of backing. Well, those are those claims that don't cost a whole lot of money, but there are are a lot of um, numbers of them and a lot of time that's involved in handling those. This other one, I don't know if you can see it in the back, hit vehicle ahead. So it's the, the traditional rear end type accident. All right? So those are our frequency drivers, our severity, hit vehicle ahead, and the intersection type accidents. Aren't those the same things we've been talking about for 15, 20 years? Same things over and over again. So let's look at what we can do with some of those. Now, National Highway Traffic Safety Association put out some numbers just in November. And it says for a non-fatal crash, the cost of the injury is 16000 Non-fatal, but with an injury, it jumps to seventy. And a crash with a fatality is five hundred thousand dollars. So, once we start pulling all those together, yeah, there's enough reason for us to make sure that we elevate our risk management efforts to address the auto side of it. Oftentimes, we go in and we're talking about. So, what are you working on from a risk management perspective? You know, blank canvas. What are you doing? Where are your efforts? Auto tends to be right off of the bottom. Not much going on there. So this is just uh, a discussion today about let's make sure it's not falling off of our radar and taking some action. Now, most of the time, I have a, a, a very dedicated sequence for the, the wave mic 
planes, my, my slides show up. I didn't have any other place to put this, so I just wanted to put this one in here. <laughs> when we go into the process of investigating a claim, oftentimes it's the, the, the scenario, let me back up. Law enforcement has a claim. They have a nasty intersection type accident. And they want to get an outside agency to come in and investigate that accident. So they bring an investigation in and they go down this path and they're waiting to get what happened in the end result before it's ever reported to your uh, professional claim handlers. So it may be two weeks, three, four, you've even seen sometimes five weeks before the darn thing is even reported. That time that was lost is a valuable lost opportunity for the claims handlers to control the cost of it. Okay, so just make sure within your operations, if you've got any claims going on, that these two sides of this process here are going at the same time. Does that make sense? Okay, from a safety perspective, culture has a lot to do with uh, our findings out in the field. As I said before, I've been doing this for quite some time, and by the time you go through and you look at all of the, the claims that have been involved with the accounts, and you're doing three and five year loss ratios, and, and accident investigations, and loss trending, and then you're comparing well, what are they doing from an accident, uh, or actually from a, a loss prevention program standpoint? You try to merge the two, and we have a lot of places that we look at that have great looking programs on paper, but you know what? Not much is being implemented out in the field. So, where the rubber meets the road, culture has a lot to do with that day-to-day -day operation of what takes place behind the wheel. Oftentimes, uh, you know, we talk about the safety culture. Safety represents the mindsets, values, and beliefs and within the entity, within the department, and within each of the work sites. Well, you can think of the auto being away from the facility, so it's considered a work site, so to speak. There is a culture at each one of these locations. Whether you want to believe it or not, it's there. So we need to identify what the culture is behind each one of these things. At the entity level, it needs to be management driven. At the department level, every department manager needs to be understanding, communicating it, and uh, at the worksite level, it needs to be pervasive even to that location. So when we look at the safety program side of it, for the uh, successful programs, culture is a big part of it. Everyone wants to be better. Expectations are accepted and fostered. And if you would, just underline that accepted and fostered right there, because you know each time we give a discussion. Each time we tell our employees something about doing their job or the safety training component, we are giving out little packets of information, right? That little packet of information says, here's what I want you to do. These are the things that are important. If they're not hearing what the important components are, then we're kind of wasting our time. But that individual also has to be receptive to that. So when we develop a significant safety culture, our expectations are given out to our work, workers, employees, and they are accepting that same level of culture. That's when we know we are being successful there. Every successful safety program has a compliance effort. These things just don't automatically happen. There has to be an enforcement part and Last but not least, management has to be driving this thing. 
They need to be originating the dialogue. The entire organization needs to be seeing them as the driving functional component. If you don't have that, we're going to have a lot of mid-level activity going on. Things happen at the risk management stage when nobody up above really supports it. All of our efforts are going to be going downhill very soon. So we need to be able to get what I call the seat of power, whoever those folks or that individual might be, but get them to help drive that program. If any one of you have uh, sat through one of my discussions out at uh, the accounts or listened uh, to one of our discussions previously, you probably heard us talking about draw your box of acceptable behaviors and manage to those behaviors. What we're talking about is every organization, this is graphically trying to display what the last slide went through, but organizational support is absolutely critical, as is the supervision, and I mean active supervision, where they are engaged in the day-to-day -day operations, not just in a pro yeah, in, in a reactive mode, but in a proactive sense. We have to have rules, behaviors, and performance that are lined out that the employees and the drivers are willing to hear and to utilize on a day-to-day -day basis. We talked about the consequences, but uh, a lot of it comes down to drawing your box of acceptable behaviors and operating from those. So, oftentimes, we, if we were to chart the losses for accounts on this chart, time going this way in years, number of accidents up here, we're looking at it and the losses just go up and down and all across, and it's like, okay, so what happened here? Well, we really had our management uh, committed. They, they really were pushing them. They wanted a reduction in number of accidents, those sort of things, and uh, we were doing pretty well, and then it just kind of fell off, and maybe we had, fill in the blank, a change of county commissioners, city council person, whoever was driving it, a local individual uh, departmental manager, and then it just fell off the radar, and then we're back up to where we were previously. What we're trying to accomplish with this, once we get good management buy-in and establishing some basic rules and processes, the consequences, loss ratios usually come down, and we can sustain a fairly gradual decline there, but especially where the employee starts watching out for me. When they start taking ownership, when they start accepting those responsibilities that we've given to them, and really then it starts improving when they start watching out for us, the entity as a whole. That's a progression, a progression that takes quite some time. But it all starts with the culture side of it. We can't just throw a couple of pieces of paper in a, in a binder, say that's our fleet safety program, and with no supervision, no enforcement, uh, no real culture around it, the expectations are not there, so it's not going to be done. That's where we typically see uh, a fair number of folks. So when we talk about the fleet controls, a couple of things you probably want to know first, and that's that auto coverage is written on the vehicle itself, not on the individual drivers. So many times we enter that discussion with our risk management folks and they say, wait, 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 you mean you don't care about an individual? Who am I going to send this uh, MVR to, to clear it? It's like, oh, wait a minute. You are responsible for who drives that vehicle. Ultimately, it is you. So you have to make those decisions of who's going to be driving. That's where we would like that responsibility to be. So you make those decisions. Yeah, we would like you to have some 
motor vehicle record guidelines that talk about at this point you become an unacceptable driver. So it gets rolled out consistently from time to time, right? Whenever it happens. You're responsible for that vehicle, no matter where it is, what happens to it. We recently had a claim this last year, and it just makes me laugh every time I think about it. Public Works parked this thing at an individual's home overnight, and they say, geez, it's our departmental rule that this vehicle is made available to everybody at all hours. So I just put the keys under the floor mat. <laughs> yeah, it disappeared. And they found it a couple of counties over, you know, down in the bottom of a ravine. But no telling what they had done with the thing, you know, during that time. Were they rat racing around, you know? Was it just a kiddo? Was it... Uh, were they backing it into uh, the convenience store at, at 3 a.m. to uh, steal the ATM machine? I don't know. But guess what? It's your responsibility. The claim will be paid by the insurance company, right? So once we get beyond that, make sure that we're developing that uh, our control processes to, to really survive some intense questioning because if we ever have to go to trial for any of this, there will be questions as to why you did this, why you did that. Really, under this negligent entrustment component here, you know, we have a lot of different reasons about why we should know who's driving the vehicle. And from a supervisory standpoint, what we did or did not do to keep them in the vehicle or out of the vehicle as, as is appropriate. And the failure to train is another area that we're starting to see some of these folks, uh, uh, lawyers, sniffing around and, and really trying to pursue that. We need to be able to show that we've got employees that have been told about the orientation, you know, the do's and the don'ts. Remember, paint that box of acceptable behavior and tell them to operate inside that box. If we can show that. We'll be doing well. Ongoing training. Fill in the blank, the defensive driving training, the post-accident investigation and training as needed, okay? Every time I put this slide up there, I get, I get some people talking about, well, it says 95% of drive of a fleet safety program is driver management, but you've only got three items here, so isn't that like two-thirds of what's there? Whatever way you want to cut it, I don't care. <laughs> Driver management includes a lot of different things. On the sheet that you have here in front of you, you can see that driver management has a lot of different items that are involved in the typical fleet safety program. Driver management. We need to have our folks actively engaged in that driver management component. Those are the parts that are going to make a difference out there. Especially when we approach it driving as a privilege. If we really are approaching it that way, then we can take it, the privilege away at some point. At least we have some leverage as to how we let that uh, process unfold as far as the supervision goes. Who you allow to drive, it goes back to our motor vehicle record components. And just know that we've got up here on the way out, you can pick up a vehicle heat safety guide if you're so interested. In it, we have some motor vehicle record guidelines and charts and samples for safety programs and all those things. But you know what? All of this stuff doesn't mean anything if our culture and our support from our main upper management group is very low, it handily engaged. So if we can get those guys showing that we have processes that, that go back to our upper management, and they're involved in it, and they're showing that they're supporting it, we're going to be a lot better off.
are there any questions about the things that we talked about at this point? There are no top secret, really sweet, short safety programs, cookie cutter thing that's going to work for everyone. What we want you to do is to make sure that you have fostered that whole process of getting your management support and getting that dialed in because we have all of these different groups that we're having to try to uh, address, so to speak, fire department, law enforcement, ambulance operations, public works, CDL drivers, non-CDL drivers, each one of those department heads needs to have that same clear understanding of where we're coming from because they're going to be the ones administering the thing. Where they fall down, the entire organization will be um, at risk there. Okay. Any questions on uh, that, that we can help you with on a basic fleet safety program or what we've talked about here? Did I lose you? <laughs> All right, thank you. So